<laughs> Hello, everybody. Move transition. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see if I can do this and do it right. It's wonderful to be over here and uh, out of Minden for a weekend. We are having a very good time. Uh, I did notice something, though. It's, it's, it's interesting when you get older couples together. <laughs> have you noticed we have a different, um, different focus than I, than I would have been at age 20, 25, even 30-ish? Um, we're a little more laid back. We're not in as big a hurry. Uh, we have different interests than we did when we were younger. But it reminded me of something. I was raised in Florida. I don't know how many of you have ever lived in Florida, especially South Florida. There, okay. Well, then you know it. There are a majority of older people down there, and I thought it was interesting. One day I went in, and I was overhearing a conversation of about three or four couples that were sitting together in a Denny's. They were having breakfast, and one of them said, "You know, it, it, it's it's terrible to get old." My eyesight is going and I just don't see things the way I used to. It's harder to see. And another one said, well, you know, my hearing's the same way. I used to have really sharp hearing and now I, I just barely hear some things. I, I'm losing my hearing. And a third one said, yeah, and my mobility, I just can't react the same way I used to. I'm, I'm losing my mobility. And they said, you know, you lose your sight, and your hearing, and your mobility. He said, thank God I could still drive. <laughs> so, <laughs> so <laughs> any of you have been to South Florida, you know, that probably wasn't a joke. <laughs> it's wonderful to be here this morning. And I'm looking forward to sharing with you some thoughts that I have on one of the powers that Charles Fillmore mentions in his The uh, 12 Powers of Man, the power of understanding. Uh, this is a talk that's under construction. It is not finished yet. I have just begun exploring it. And I tell you why, I really had no background in the 12 powers. When I was coming up, we, we really didn't mention the 12 powers in church that often. I went to CEP, or what's called SEE now, the training programs, took, I think, about two dozen courses. One of them was the 12 powers, and I just don't remember anything about what I studied. Then I went into ministerial school, and believe it or not, we didn't really have many classes on the 12 powers. I, I just don't think we discussed it that much. And so I came out, and to be honest, I did over 900 lessons, individual lessons sometimes doing two a day, but 900 individual lessons, none on the 12 powers. And so when I got an invitation from Unity of Davis to do the, one of the 12 powers in July, and then Meg called and said, can you do something in June for us? I thought, I need to look at the 12 powers because I've had a different opinion about the 12 powers because of a couple of things that happened. First of all, when Paul and I got to uh, Nevada, we met a rabbi, his name was Jonathan Fryrish. Jonathan was the rabbi at South Lake Tahoe at Temple Bat Yam. And one of the classes that he taught was on the Jewish mystical tradition of the tree of life or Kabbalah or Kabbalah. We found a great appreciation for the K Kabbalah. It was excellent, good theology, good psychology. It, it arranged things beautifully. He even previewed and went through a book called The, what was, the Seventh Telling by Rabbi Mitchell Chaffetz. And it was excellent, very difficult to read, but it introduced me to something that I had not seen in the um, Fillmore model, which was the powers or the sephirot, the, the, the spheres are balanced with each other. They have complementary parts. They're not just there, they, they complement one another. And I then went to a class, I think it was in December and January with a minister in Tallahassee, Florida. His name was Reverend Bill Williams. 
And Bill presented the 12 powers using the Kabbalistic model of pairing them up. It was excellent. And so I had a completely different view of the powers. And now I'm kind of caught in between Kabbalah and 12 powers. So what you're gonna to get today is not pure unity, but it's not pure Kabbalah, it's Larry's interpretation. Okay, so there may be some differences. Where I want to bring them in today is with the idea of the whirly gig. Charles Fillmore talked about a whirly gig. Have any of you ever seen a whirly gig? This is a whirly gig. You probably hear called pinwheels. You've probably seen some of them out. If you're from Florida, they look like flamingos with their little wings turning in the wind. Or if you go down the street now, have you ever seen one of these big long tubes where the thing is going up and down and make all sorts of gesture? Those are whirly gigs. They're motion machines. They're made so that you are distracted and can pay attention to them because they want your attention. And when your attention is drawn to that whirly gig, you're not watching the road, you're not thinking for yourself. The whirly gig has your mind in that moment. And that's what we want to talk about because the power of understanding requires that you break the connection with the whirly gig and turn to something more important what's in your mind and what you want to put in your mind, not what the whirly gig wants you to see in here. And that's the talk today. We're going to look at the power of understanding and try to break the power of the whirly gig. Now, there's a difference between understanding and knowledge. Knowledge represents facts that you can acquire by reading a book, going to a library, taking a course. Understanding is based on knowledge, but understanding takes it a step further. Understanding at its pure essence has to do with how you put the knowledge together into a big picture that brings everything into the mix. Knowledge, just facts, understanding, how you take it and put it together in a big picture. Okay, that's important because that's the power. The ability to take those individual things and make them connect in a new way. We're even gonna do a meditation today that uh, Star and Paula got me started on this morning that is gonna challenge you to do just that. But understanding has two levels. One is human, one is our moral divine. The human level basically requires the human senses, things that come in through our senses, things that come in through our experience, our knowledge, but it's limited. It can only go so far, but it does because it is understanding. It still has the same elements that we're gonna find when we go to divine understanding. It allows you to see a bigger picture. Now I was introduced really the first time I remember a profound experience of understanding was in a history course in college. I almost dropped the course because the, the professor required not only the textbook, but he required little paperback books. One was The Plague by Albert Camus. The other, Thus Spoke Zarathustra by Frederick Nietzsche. Uh, the Painted Bird by Kosinski. Oh, what were the others? Treblinka, the model Nazi uh, extermination camp. I don't remember by who. Um, the Communist Manifesto, a book on nationalism and patriotism and man's search for meaning by uh, Viktor Frankl. Now, almost scared me off. I'm so happy I took the course because he didn't teach facts. He taught understanding. We began to weave together the manifesto, nationalism, patriotism, the painted bird, 
all of these philosophy, psychology, history, military, political, and everything began to weave together so that you saw when you pulled one, they all moved. He painted a big picture with all those little parts. It was beautiful, absolutely beautiful. I came away from that class. It changed every class I took from then on because I began to see a bigger picture than just the facts that were being taught. The facts are the whirly bird, the gig. You need to put it down and see the bigger picture. And so that worked for me. I've also seen it in practical work with uh, Paula's brother, Mark. Mark is a just phenomenal in the area of mechanics. He, he's just brilliant. Paula and I were working on our graduate degrees, my doctorate and her master's at Texas. Paula received a gift of some sort. It, it was basically a locomotive, a choo-choo. <laughs> made out of wood and it was in pieces that you had to put together a certain way so it would hold together and it formed a train. It was really something else. We decided to take it apart, put it back together again, time ourselves so that we could take it to Mark and see if we could outdo him. So we took it apart and we started to put it back together. <laughs> She's over here laughing. <laughs> We never got that thing back together. <laughs> we could not figure out how it worked. <laughs> so we said, well, what are we gonna do? Paula said, I'm gonna put it in a paper bag and we're gonna take it to him. <laughs> so we took it to Mark. Now Mark's got that big picture ability when it comes to mechanics. We dumped it out and told him, it looks like a train when you finish it. And in two minutes time, <laughs> without even seeing what the finished product was gonna look like, he had finished that train. That's understanding. And we all have it in different areas, music, art, science, whatever. We all have it. We have the ability to get beyond the restricted factual stuff that's on a small and open our minds to something much larger. That's what we have to look forward to with understanding. <clears throat> but there's also, besides a practical human level of understanding versus just the facts, we also have divine understanding. And that's where, oh, we may know the 12 powers. We may know unity five principles. We may know all sorts of details, but do we have the ability to put them together into a bigger picture? That's the question. Do we come away with a parochial thinking? This is right and wrong. I've been taught that this is right and wrong and it's all there is to it. Or do we have the ability to discern? That's the other is called judgment where I've been told that's wrong. Do we have the ability to see the bigger picture? We're in a big debate, Paul and I and some other people about abortion right now and we're not so sure anymore. We have new ways of thinking about it. What do, you, what do you do about the unwanted children that are gonna be coming into this world now to families that can't afford to keep them? Who's gonna take care of that? I mean, you, you, you're upset because of murder, but you're not upset because you're gonna restrict them to a life of who knows what. What do you do if they come into an abusive family? We're only gonna handle, handle part of the problem or do we look universally? And we say, when we look at these issues, we look at the big picture. And when it comes to how we're going to deal with people, what do we do? That's understanding. That's taking it out of the one, one issue and looking at the big picture. Are we looking at something that separates us? Usually at this microscopic level, that's what we're doing. It's them versus us, our team versus their team. We're gonna be the winners, they're gonna be the losers. There always has to be a dualistic view of it at that lower level. But when you use understanding at the highest level, you find a way that everybody can win something. You look and you understand who and what they are and their position. Now, if you ever wanna see a 
good example of that dualistic separatist thinking, look at the Congress of the United States right now. They are in that mode. Uh, don't look at them too long because <laughs> they're a whirly gig. I don't care what channel you turn to, they want you to listen to what they have to say. And you need to think for yourself. You need to listen to these things carefully and then take them back in and apply understanding to them for yourself. And that is divine understanding. That's where it really gets out there broad. And we've got plenty of examples. If you want to look at the head of the person, the back of the head of the person in front of you, so to speak, Look at Jesus, look at what he did when he was faced with Roman soldiers that were occupying their country. And he said, be, be kind to him. He even treated the, 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 the child of a Roman soldier and healed him. He, he, he saw the big picture, he saw the humanity, he saw, so to speak, the Christ in everybody. And so he was able to see the universal, he wasn't, drawn by that whirly gig of them versus us. Y'all, let's see, who else did I have down? Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela had every reason to be against a lot of the people in South Africa once they got their freedom from apartheid. But what did he do? He said, there will be no retribution. If you will come forward and tell us the truth, no matter how heinous the crime you committed, there will be no retribution. We want to know the truth. Nelson Mandela saw the big picture and he knew that if they started to go for retribution, there would be a reaction upon them again and this thing would just keep going. He said, that's it, we're gonna end it right now. And I think he got most of, a lot of his information by looking at the back of Gandhi's head. Think about it. These people are seeing people in front of them who are showing understanding, the ability to think beyond just the facts into something bigger and broader. George Washington Carver is a favorite of mine. Here's a black man that lived in this, a time when he was forbidden to go to school, yet, he was brilliant and he did so many things for America. Synthetic fuels made out, of, made out of soybean that we still could go back to if we wanted to. He didn't do peanut butter regardless of what you think, but he did the peanut, crop rotation, dyes, paints, chemicals, medicines, all sorts of things. And you, you know he patented them, but guess what? He gave most of the patents to the school back before it was required. He didn't need it, he wanted to share everything. And that's one of the biggest, biggest outcomes of going deep into understanding, especially spiritual understanding. Spiritual understanding, you will wanna share it with people and see them prosper, see them grow. Because at that level, there's a selflessness to it. And I guarantee you there are nameless people all over this world that you and I have never met that are practicing divine understanding. We just don't see them every day and they stay under the radar because they don't wanna be known. They're just doing their thing. Most recently, I read about something that happened in World War II that I thought was fa fantastic that an entire community had divine understanding. Uh, in Octo Friday, October the 1st, 1943, the Nazi SS had planned to round up all the Danish Jews and we're gonna send them out to sea basically. But one of the Danish people warned, started to warn them. They felt obligated because they were part of their people. It didn't matter about their religion. <laughs> and so the day and the night before the SS were to come storming in, they basically emptied the countryside of Danish Jews. They were whisked off to other places. And when the Nazis showed up, there was hardly anybody there. They found that 99% of the Danish Jews survived the Holocaust. 
because people practice divine understanding. They got beyond their own group, they got into other people, and they were able to work together. That's what's possible. And so there we have it, general understanding, human understanding, but we also have divine understanding, which can take us to a new level. I would like to end today with a story from Jimmy Carter's book, Always a Reckoning, in which he's gonna talk about his mother, Ms. Lillian. And in that book, she tells a story. And in that story, she is gonna go from basic human understanding, in fact, a low level of it, to the very end where she has divine understanding. I invite you to listen carefully and see if you can see the transition points between her levels of understanding. This is what she wrote. This is her story. When I nursed in a clinic in, near Bombay, a small girl, shielding all her leprous sores, crept inside the door. I moved away, but the doctor called, you take this case. First, I found a mask and put it on, quickly gave the child a shot, and then, not very well, I slipped away to be alone and scrub my entire body red and raw. I faced her treatment every week with dread and loathing of the chore, not of the girl. And as time passed, I was less afraid and managed not to turn my face away. Her spirit bloomed as the sores began to fade. She raised her anxious eyes to mine to show that she trusted me We'd smile and say a few Marahadi words, then reach and hold each other's hands. And then love grew between us. So that later, when I kissed her lips, I didn't feel unclean. We can all go through the process of this transformation from understanding at the human level to the divine level. It can happen in a day, it can happen in a moment, but it always takes us from a narrow understanding to something broad and beautiful. The love, love that's not, uh, by the way, focused on the whirly gig. It goes to the heart of love that's inside each of us. And we know the love that's in somebody else. And that's your lesson for today. I would like to do a meditation based on that lesson. And thanks to Paula and Star this morning, we had a little discussion. And I said, you know what? That's a beautiful meditation. So I'd like you to prepare for the meditation now. Close your eyes, if you will. And clear your mind as much as you can. And I will give you an image and ask you to focus on this image. Take a breath, relax. I want you to imagine a vehicle. That's all. Maybe the first thing will come to mind is a car, a plane, a train, a bus, whatever, just a vehicle. and focus on it for a second.
And now let's use our power of understanding to go a little bit further. That's kind of ordinary to me. What about a book as a vehicle? Have you ever read a book that opens your mind and your heart in a way you never had experienced it before? Have you ever experienced a book as a vehicle? Notice how it makes you feel when you think about something that has done that. And now have you ever seen a piece of artwork, statue, picture, photograph, that's been a vehicle for transforming your thoughts. And now what about something like music? Is there a particular piece of music that when you hear it, it transforms you, it transports you in mind and heart? What about symbols like a cross, a crucifix, a star of David? That just by seeing that symbol, all of a sudden your mind is opened up and transported into a larger field of truth. And now all I ask is that you realize we've only started this journey into what vehicles are. We haven't talked about dreams. There's so much more. There are many different types of vehicles. I almost bet you when we first started this, the first thing that came to mind was simply a car or a train or a bus or a boat, something simple. But by relaxing our thoughts and opening our minds and even to other people's suggestions, all of a sudden our world just expanded into art, music, books, dreams, That's the power of understanding when it's unleashed. It's very creative. And now I invite you, take a good breath and start to come back slowly. Again, take another deep breath and then open your eyes and be present. I'm off to the side, but I want to share a statement by Charles Fillmore and what's in one of the new metaphysical books by Unity, and that is divine understanding has within it compassion.
and compassion is love. So we all have within us, every last one of us, the potential for divine understanding and divine love. We need to choose it this day. It's time to get off the fence, stop looking at the whirly gigs, and look to God first. And so it is.